Hi, I'm Jeff Sorrell. I'm an analyst on the detection response team at Cisco Talos. I use Snort every day for threat detection, and so in this video, we'll be showing you how to get up and running with Snort 2. Uh, it's an open source network IDS with an easy to use signature language. Uh, we'll be using Wireshark to look at packet captures and Docker to actually run Snort. The easiest recommended way to install Snort is through your Linux distros package manager. If you're on BSD, there's a Snort 2 port. By installing with the package manager, you're going to have dependencies resolved for you, stuff like libpcat, libpcre, libdac. Um, you can compile it from source. That's the second option. Uh, a couple different uh, benefits from compiling from source. You can enable additional debugging features. Um, and uh, just like any other C project, uh, you'll download the source code tarball, run configure, make, and make install. If that's the route you'd like to go, we have a couple of uh, suggested compile time options. The first one is dash dash enable source fire. This will enable uh, a bunch of different features, but the main ones are PPM and rule profiling. So PPM stands for Packet Performance Monitor. Uh, this uh, does something where uh, when Snort is inspecting a packet, if it's taking too long to process, it'll go ahead and fast path that packet. This ensures that you have a minimum throughput. Um, so you're, you're kind of cutting down on detection, but you're guaranteeing a certain throughput for your Snort instance. The next one that we recommend uh, is if you're doing debugging is dash dash enable GDB. This is going to compile Snort with debug symbols. For instance, you know, if you're using the GNU debugger and you're stepping through Snort source code, dash dash enable debug messages is a cool feature which allows you to set a bash environment variable, which Snort will read. And with certain settings, Snort will print additional debug messages while it's running. As an easy starting point, we've already created a Docker container for you, which is based on Debian. Um, if you're interested in the dependencies for Snort 2, go ahead and take a look at the Docker file. Uh, all those packages are going to be Debian packages, so if you're using a different Linux distro, those package names might be a little bit different for you. Snort needs rules in order to be effective. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to go to snort.org, and under the download section, you'll see a rules section. There's three different categories. The first is community, the second is registered, and finally subscriber. The community rule set just contains community submitter rules, uh, community user submitted rules. Uh, the registered rule set is going to contain all of the Talos rules. Uh, it's free to use. You just need a snort.org login. The uh, subscriber rule set is paid for, um, but you get all of the latest rules. You get everything in registered, except it's, uh, it's up to date as soon as we publish a rule set. So registered is free, but it's 30 days behind. So for this video, I would recommend either registered or subscriber. Uh, the biggest difference is you're going to get rule categories and you're going to get shared object rules, uh, which are going to come in handy later on. After downloading and decompressing this tarball, you're going to see a few different directories. The first is the Etsy directory. This is going to contain everything uh, that Snort needs to be configured. So the main, the main configuration file is snort.conf, and we'll, just, we'll get to that in just a moment. Inside the rules folder, you'll see all of the uh, Snort text rule files. Those are split into different files for different rule categories. So whichever uh, rule category a rule applies to, you'll find it in that, uh, that given rules file. If you open up one of the rules files, you'll notice that some of the rules are commented out while some aren't. So commented out rule files are, uh, or rules rather, are not loaded by Snort. So that's an easy way to enable or disable a rule. Um, if you find that one is triggering too often, you can go ahead and comment it out and reload Snort. The next folder we'll take a look at is the SO rules folder. This contains text rules files, which are special rules called stub rules. So stub rules tell Snort that it should load a specific rule function from a compiled shared object. Um, again, you can comment or uh, uncomment these rules files. If you downloaded the subscriber register rule set, you should see this SO rules folder. The last folder is preprog rules. So there's a couple files in there, decoder, sensitive data, and preprocessor. Uh, it's a little bit confusing because sensitive data is actually itself a preprocessor. So preprocessors run after the packet decoder and before rule evaluation. So we'll take a look at the decoder file first. When a packet is first ingested by Snort, the, the basic function 
that the decoder does is it does some basic validation of network packets. So stuff like IP, TCP, Ethernet has to have a minimum uh, structure in order to continue being processed by Snort. So the decoder can generate alerts for you with anomalies. So let's say you have unusual IP options or TCP options set, the decoder can generate alert for you. After decoding, uh, the packet moves on to different application layer preprocessors. Um, Stream 5, which does TCP reassembly and UDP tracking and ICMP, uh, Stream 5 is also a preprocessor. So these preprocessors uh, can themselves generate alerts. Um, the biggest part that preprocessors take in snort uh, packet evaluation is that they'll normalize traffic. So we're not looking at individual TCP packets, we're actually looking at a longer reassembled TCP buffer, which is very useful for detection. Um, one example of a preprocessor that gets used all the time is HTTP inspect. To give you an example of a uh, preprocessor rule that fires, we have a HI client long header. So that rule triggers uh, when an anomaly is seen, in this case, an overly long HTTP header. And that threshold can be configured in the snort.com file in the HTTP inspect section. HTTP inspect is also going to take care of parsing out HTTP URI, HTTP header inside the uh, HTTP traffic. So those are, give you rules provided, um, rule provided keywords. And in addition, server responses are oftentimes gzip compressed. Uh, HTTP inspect will take care of that compression for you. It'll decompress things and put them in the file data buffer. And that's available to you with the file data keyword. The last file, sensitive data. Uh, the sensitive data preprocessor's job is to look for uh, sensitive information like social security numbers, credit card numbers, phone numbers, um, and that could indicate somebody p potentially exfilling data from your network. Of course, it has to be unencrypted, um, so just keep that in mind. For our installation, we'll have the, all of these rules directories inside the main Snort Etsy folder. So go ahead and move the preproc rules, rules, and SO rules into the Etsy directory. So this is going to be our snort config that Docker is actually going to mount virtually into the Docker container. So now that we have all our rules set up, let's go back into the Etsy folder. We're going to open up the snort.conf. This contains all of the preprocessor config options, rule paths, IP and port settings. There is a lot of stuff in the snort.conf file. Um, what I found is that most of it doesn't need to be touched. Um, it's, it's, it's a really good solid base configuration for most people. Um, there's just a couple of things that we're going to tweak to use in our environment. The first is an IP variable called external net. So external net and home net are both used in the rule header. And what they are is their definitions of IP address ranges or single IP addresses or commissated separated lists of IP ranges or addresses. So external net is going to be um, typically untrusted traffic, right? So external net you might set to any network that's not internal. Home net, you might put something uh, RFC 1918 in, um, and home net is typically trusted traffic. That's internal traffic. So for this video, we're going to set both of them to any any, just to uh, just for convenience. Um, when you're testing PCAP, sometimes it's helpful because you don't have to actually worry about P, uh, IP addresses inside the PCAP file. Setting these variables to more specific IP addresses is helpful for a real production instance. Uh, this can help reduce false positives. For instance, um, we have a rule which, which detects SMB directory listings. So if you have uh, a home net to home net set, you might see that uh, rule triggering all the time because that could be uh, typical internal traffic for you. However, if that rule is coming from an external network to your internal network, you might want to be alerted because that sounds kind of fishy. Um, and the second type of variable type is, is uh, port variables. So one really common one is HTTP ports. Again, that's a representation inside the rule header. That's a variable that gets used inside the rule header. HTTP ports is just a list of ports that you're running HTTP traffic on. So when Snort loads, these ports are registered for HTTP inspect. So if you're running HTTP traffic on, on a given port that's not listed, you'll want to go ahead and add that to that port list. That way, HTTP inspect is invoked when, it, when the stream preprocessor sees traffic on that port. HTTP inspect will then take the traffic on that port and give you those nice, um, 
normalized HTTP buffers like URI and header. A little bit further down, we're going to tune some rule path stuff. So the first variable we'll look at is rule underscore path. We're going to set that to Etsy snort rules. The next one is SO rule path. We'll set that to Etsy snort SO rules. And finally, preproc rule path, Etsy snort preproc rules. Uh, scrolling a little bit further down the snort conf, you'll see some include statements. This is how the snort conf includes, includes specific rule files. So you can comment or uncomment out whichever categories you'd like. Um, you can uh, also include you know, whichever custom rule files you'd like, maybe like local rules or something like that. Uh, the last thing we're going to do is tell Snort where it should find comp compiled shared object files. That's done with the dynamic detection directory line. So for this video, we'll set that to Etsy Snort Etsy SO rules. Now that we've got our Snort comp set up and our rules in the right places, uh, it's going to be helpful to get familiar with a couple of Snort command line arguments. The first is dash C. This tells Snort where to find the snort.comp file. Dash A, dash capital A, is going to select an alert style for you. So something very vanilla would be like console alerts. The, uh, I, I personally like dash, uh, dash A CMG, which gives you a CMG style alert, which is a hex dump of the packet that triggered the alert. The next option we want to use is dash capital Q. This configures Snort for inline mode. What that means is we do TCP reassembly before the client acknowledges it. This is the recommended way to, to run Snort. Snort has two main inspection modes, so inline and passive. Um, if you're running off of a tap or you're not interested in dropping traffic, you might run in passive mode. Um, it's still possible to run in inline even if you're not dropping traffic. Um, inline is the recommended way to, to run Snort. The next one we'll use is dash R, which specifies a single PCAP for Snort to read. If you're interested in running a directory of PCAPs, you might use the dash dash PCAP dir option. Uh, dash dash PCAP reset is useful when running a directory of PCAPs because this resets Snort inspection state, things like TCP state. Um, dash dash PCAP show will tell Snort to print the PCAP name as it's reading PCAPs back. So in the first lab, let's take our new Snort configuration and test it. Change into the Docker directory. And the first thing we need to do is build the Snort2 Docker container. So we'll do that with the build.sh script provided. All it's done, doing inside this script is calling docker build and using the Docker file in the current directory. So that's going to create a Debian image for you with Snort already installed. After you see that the uh, Docker image has been successfully built, the next thing we're going to use is the connect.sh script. It takes a single command line argument, which is our Snort Etsy folder. Docker is going to go ahead and mount that Etsy folder for us uh, virtually into the Etsy snort uh, in, inside the container. So once you run the connect script, pass it dash C Etsy, and you should have a, a command line shell into the Docker instance at this point. We're going to change to the Etsy snort directory. This contains all of the config files that we just configured, and we're going to test our snort configuration by telling snort to load the config but not actually inspect traffic. So we'll run snort-c snort.conf dash capital T. And dash capital T is the option for testing. If everything came back clean, you should see uh, the snort configuration was successfully validated. Now that we know we have a working conf, we'll go ahead and run a sample PCAP through our rule set. So change the labs2 directory, and in this directory you'll see a couple of different files. The first is a local rules file, which defines a very simple rule that's looking for a curl user agent. So we'll, uh, the, the second one is a, uh, is a PCAP, which just contains a simple curl request to a URL. We'll change the Docker directory again, and we'll use a third script called run PCAP. Run PCAP is light connect, and it's going to virtually mount our Etsy folder, but it's also going to mount a PCAP directory. So if you open up the run pcap script, you can see all of the different uh, command line arguments that we're passing to snort. We'll use dash c to, to mount our Etsy folder, and then we'll use dash p to mount the labs2 directory. And uh, once snort's running, we can see that it ran and read our pcap, but we didn't get an alert that was generated. Um, and so 
this is um, a problem that we run into uh, all the time for new users, uh, myself included, which is invalid PCAP checksums. So IP uh, packets and TCP and UDP packets uh, contain a checksum that needs to be valid for SNORT to inspect it. So when a, uh, a network endpoint is, uh, is reading traffic, if it, uh, if it contains an invalid checksum, that means something went wrong while the packet was in transit. So it'll discard that packet. When SNORT is on the network and it's reading traffic that has invalid checksums, it's going to go ahead and, and exclude those from inspection because it knows the host that it's going to is going to throw that packet away. So SNORT doesn't want to spend any time inspecting traffic that doesn't matter. So what we need to do is we're going to uh, open up Wireshark to look at our packet capture. And we don't, if you have the default configuration for Wireshark, you actually can't see when a, um, when a packet has an invalid checksum without browsing down into the uh, network layers. So we're going to enable that. I'm on Mac, so it might be a little bit different for you on Windows or on Linux. But we're going to go into Wireshark Preferences. And you can expand the protocols list on the left-hand side of the pane and uh, look for TCP, UDP, and IP. Under each of those protocol options, we're going to enable the checkbox, which uh, says to do checksum validation. After that, and you go back to the main window, we'll click Accept. You'll see packets with uh, red and black. So the red and black now is indicating that there's error with that. And if we look into the packet, it says that uh, the checksum is inv invalid. So as there's a simple fix for that. Um, you'll want to have the TCP replay or TCP dump suite of tools installed. There is a tool in that suite called TCP rewrite. And so we're going to use that uh, to fix the checksums in the packet capture. We included a tool, a, a little shell script called fix checksum. And that does, uh, that calls the command line argument and it does, uh, it'll back up or, or copy over the original PCAP. So after we fix the PCAP checksums, we'll do run.pcap uh, or run pcap.sh again. We'll see an alert that gets generated. Uh, we'll see that it has a JID1 and SID1 million. The uh, JID stands for generator ID. And for text rules, that's always going to be 1. For SO rules, that's always going to be 3. And preprocessor uh, rules have different JIDs uh, pertaining to each different preprocessor. That's followed by the PCAP name and finally the rule message. So, and since we use dash capital A CMG, we get a nice uh, hex dump of the packet that triggered the rule. In the last lab, we're going to enable an HTTP inspect option, which allows inspection inside compressed flash files. If you change to the Labs 3 folder, you'll see a PCAP. This PCAP contains a compressed flash file collected from a neutrino drive-by exploit. The flash file contained a zero day at the time, which is now CVE 2015-5119. The exploit in the action strip bytecode, we can't actually see with SNORT because of an encryption routine. However, the encryption routine does use a static key, and that is visible as long as we can decompress the flash file. This decryption key content match would make for a good SNORT rule. So if you open up the local rules file, you can see our rule, which has that static key in it. Change back to the Docker directory and open up etc.snort.conf. Scroll down to the HTTP inspect preprocessor configuration section. We're going to add decompress underscore SWF deflate LZMA. Go ahead and save and close that file. And we're going to use the run PCAP script again. And we're going to patch it dash C etsy dash P labs3 directory. After snort runs, we can see that the PCAP was read and we get an alert. So this indicates that snort was able to decompress the flash file and alert on the static key in the file data buffer. Thanks for listening. I hope that you'll continue watching the video series, which has more SNORT 2 and SNORT 3 information.